Good afternoon. We're trying another attempt, Facebook Live. I actually had to restart my internet. I am praying that we get through today's broadcast. So hang in there, saints of God, as we continue this word as Holy Spirit brings us freedom. Amen. How many of you want freedom today? I want freedom today. Barbara Darby, do you want freedom? I want freedom, sister. Hey, Jean, do you want freedom, sister? Lisa, I know you do. Oh, amen. Hey, Lori, I'm actually on my iPad, so things are much clearer because it's my iPad. I was on this iPhone, but I decided to move over to my iPad, and I am praying that, amen, Joelle, you're going to get freedom, sister. I am praying that this Facebook Live endures in Jesus' name. What's up, Let me know. There I am again. Okay, it keeps freezing. I don't know what's wrong with our internet, and I have to be careful how fast I move because I think it's just too much for my internet connection to handle. So let us move forward. Amen. God, we thank you for this word today as it comes forth in Jesus' name. And if it keeps cutting off, I am so super sorry. We will get this broadcast made eventually, but I am praying I can get through as much as possible today. Let us look at Isaiah 54. Let us start with verse 1 out of the Amplified. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. Sing, O barren one, you who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who did not travail with child. For the spiritual children of the desolate one will be more than the children of the married wife, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Spare not, lengthen your cords, and strengthen your stakes. For you shall spread abroad to the right hand and to the left, and your offspring will possess the nations and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for you shall not be ashamed, neither be confounded and depressed. For you shall not be put to shame, for you shall forget the shame of your youth, and you shall not seriously remember the reproach of your widowhood any more, in Jesus' name. So we are looking at Isaiah 54, 4, Isaiah 54, 1 through 4. Now let me read this one more time, and again, I pray that the internet's going to work. It is acting up, and I know that the enemy does not want this message going out there. Because this is a powerful message, and we are going to see this follow through in Jesus' name. Verse 1, Isaiah 54, verses 1 through 4, out of the Amplified. Saying, O barren one, you who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who did not travail with child. For the spiritual children of the desolate one will be more than the children of the married wife, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. And let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right hand and to the left. And your offspring will possess the nations and make the desolate places to be inhabited. Fear not, for you shall not be ashamed. Neither be confounded and depressed, for you shall not be put to shame, for you shall forget the shame of your youth, and you shall not seriously remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. So we are looking at these four verses, and God has so much in these four verses that is absolutely going to blow your mind. This is all we have time to do today, and eventually, probably Monday, I will pick up after Isaiah 54, 4, and we will start with Isaiah 54, 5, and we will get in deeper into that. This is one of my favorite chapters of the Word to teach on because there's so much revelation. And what is interesting, as I was reading it, Holy Spirit was bringing me some revelation out of the book that I'm still writing and getting ready in two weeks to be on Amazon. Destiny is absolutely amazing. But Holy Spirit was giving me more revelation of what I've been writing on 
And it actually brings more understanding than I had before. I absolutely love the spirit of understanding. When you know the spirit of understanding, and it's actually going to be the next book of God's Bible School of the Prophets, which will actually be three books away, because the next book that I'm doing after Destiny is the first of the Watchmen series, which is Revelation 22-2, which is God's tree of life, God's life guards. And then I'm doing Healing of the Soul, book four, session four. And then I'm going to do session five of God's Bible School of the Prophets, the spirit of understanding. The spirit of understanding has a perspective, an anointing, to cause you to discern. If you want great discernment, not only is the spirit of the fear of the Lord awesome, but the spirit of understanding brings discernment of the word. It also brings discernment of other people's anointings as Holy Spirit shows you their anointings. So when we are talking about Isaiah 54 and we're looking at verses 1 through 4, the spirit of understanding brings us greater understanding in order to perceive where it applies to us. The word is alive. It is operative. It is working in your life right now. And God is bringing it even more to this season where you cross over into God's plans and purposes. Right now, you are in what feels like the wilderness. And if you are there, well, praise to the living God. Praise be to Him because you are right exactly where God wants you in order to grow. The litmus test in our growth is the maturity in the love of Christ Jesus that we walk in. So let's look first and foremost at Isaiah 54 verse 1. And just FYI, I'm actually going to be teaching out of God's Firewall School, the Prophet Session 4, the Spirit of Knowledge. For those of you who have this book, it actually, the teaching I'm going to do starts from page 123 and it goes to page 136. So if you have that book, get it tonight and go through these pages and listen to this Facebook Live and it'll bring greater understanding. So when we look at the singing where God says, Sing, O barren one, you who did not bear child. You who did not break forth into singing. First and foremost, we see a barrenness. What does barren mean? It means where you look like you're destitute, where you're going through trials and tribulations. You look like you're in a wilderness. Remember, wilderness, the root word for wilderness is debar, and it actually means to speak. God speaks to us in our wilderness. Or can I say we start to listen, amen? We listen to God in our wilderness. Why? Because we're destitute. And when you overcome, as we will see in Isaiah 54, 3, where her children will go and inhabit the desolate places and cause those desolate places to be inhabited, that is an indicator. When you walk in the word of life, in the word of truth, and you have that strength of God supplied unto you, you have an anointing where there has been desolation, where there has been oppression, you have a grace by God Almighty to cast the devil out in Jesus' name and for Holy Spirit to fill us in Jesus' name and other people. So that's what we're going to look at. When you know and you have received this abundant life, as you go from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3.18, remember, we're in a process we go from glory to glory as we behold within what? An unveiled face and we are looking in that mirror. We're being transformed into that likeness from what? Glory to glory. And as we are transformed into that likeness that we behold, it indicates that we have the mind of Christ. Amen. And if I'm talking fast, it's because I'm trying to hurry up and beat the speed of the battery life that is on this iPad. Because again, I have not charged it in about a month's time. And so I'm trying to beat the battery life and get this message in. So let's look first and foremost, and let's look at the word saying, S-I-N-G. Saying, O barren one. This word saying is actually the Hebrew word ranon, and it means to shout. It means to be aloud with joy, to cry, to be joyful, rejoice, to triumph. Do you understand that in your barren season, you are be being prepared for your destiny? And let me give you just a little snippet of analogy that I've been writing on that I actually just finished in my last chapter, chapter 4, that ends at about page 267. And I still have one more chapter to write. I think chapter 4 was actually 70 to 80 pages. In chapter 4, God began to reveal to me about the winter season. We know in Song of Solomon 2, 
where the word of God talks about that the winter is over, that that season is over and now the spring comes and there's the budding of the flower. There's also the budding of the grapes on the vine, the tender grapes, those new grapes. When we look at that, we get an idea of what actually happens to us in this process of barrenness. Because your winter season is very much your barren season. That is when the fruits are not on the vine. That is when the leaves fall. So those plants, those grape vines actually look barren. They look desolate. You might even think they were dead if you did not know what was actually going on within that vine, within those branches. So in its barren state, there's no buds, there's no leaves, there's no grapes. It looks absolutely hideous and desolate. But this is the thing, saints of God. In that barren season, what happens in the winter season, what happens in that vine is the vascular system shuts down. There are vascular plants, and those plants are vascular because there's vessels much demonstrative of how we have vessels in us that carry blood. And so the blood life source of the plant is represented in the water that's being supplied unto it continually. And it's what is called xylem. X-Y-L-E-M. X-Y-L-E-M. Xylem. And that xylem is the vascular system, which is also known as a trachea, that supplies water as it takes the water up from the roots and it supplies it to the leaves, it supplies it to the buds, it supplies it to the stems and the trees. And so because of the vascular system in the grapevine, the trees and the grapes and the leaves are able to blossom because the water is coming up from the root system. Now remember this, because your barren season is the season that you have to bring a greater grace where God is giving you such power and authority in knowing the love of God. He has given you that grace, but do you perceive it? Do you know your need for mercy? Remember what we talked about on Wednesday, knowing your need for mercy? When you know your need, or can I say when you know your barrenness, then you know your desperation and you're like Hannah that cries out for more of God. And so God allows the desolate season. He allows the wintertime season. What is interesting is in the winter season with a grapevine, with that vascular plant, is that xylem shuts down. And that xylem is what brings water from the roots and it feeds it to the buds. Well, it has to shut down in the winter. Why? Because if it did not shut down and if water was being supplied to those buds, what would happen when the air would freeze and there would be a hard freeze? Those buds would break off. So what happens in the winter season is that xylem shuts down and those buds are dehydrated. How many of you have dehydrators and you love to get fruits? One of my favorite things was apricots, dried apricots, but I do not eat them because the ketogenic diet will not let me. I have to wait till my carb up days. But those dried apricots, when you put them apricots in a dehydrator, what happens? They shrink and they get very, very small. That's actually a good indication of what happens in the winter season when we're looking at grapevines. And all of a sudden, the leaves fall off. And all we see are little nubs on a branch. There is no flower on that branch. It is nothing but a nub. No life looking upon that nub. However, I beg to differ. Because actually, what's happened is the bud is dehydrated within that plant. And the chromosomes that are feeding and are in that bud, giving it information, are telling it, look, when winter is over, you're going to be a grape. When winter is over, you're going to be in plenty. But this is the thing, saints of God, that bud does not know it in the wintertime. In fact, it is hidden underneath that nub and it is compressed and pressed down into a tight place and it is just crying, wanting to get out. And that is what we'll see actually when we get to uh, session seven of God's firewall school of the prophets, the spirit of might. Because when you're in a compressed place, the spirit of might comes upon you. Why? Because of the need. Because you need God. Or can I say, you need breakthrough. You need justice. And one of the perspectives 
of the spirit of might, one of the particular uh, graces that God has provided is that it brings his justice. And what justice does is say, wait a minute. I'm not just a compressed, dried up, dehydrated bud. I'm a bud that's about to have grapes. And all of a sudden, the spirit of might brings God's justice where you come to terms that your circumstances are not going to determine who you are or who your destiny is, but the spirit of God's might has stirred you up that says, I refuse to stay in winter anymore because it's time, it's spring. Hallelujah. And that is what the barren state does. It brings the need because remember the sevenfold dimension of Holy Spirit. You get that dimension, that purpose that each dimension has of Holy Spirit according to your need. And in your winter season, your desolate season, hallelujah, that is when you need God's might. And that is when he brings justice in order to get you fired up, to get you stinking mad, hallelujah, at the devil to what I like to say is glory to God, get the word of God out, the sword, and slice and dice him up and put him on a barbecue like Psalm 74, 14, woo, hallelujah, where God cuts up Leviathan and feeds him to the creatures in the wilderness. Your Holy Spirit anointing by the Spirit of might wakes you up to a new season, to spring. Woo! I'm just going to turn around that. Woo! Hallelujah. How many of you are ready for springtime in Jesus' name? So this word saying, Renan, it means to shout. Why are you shouting? Because the spirit of might has come on you. You're rejoicing because you're about to enter a new season. Now, this is what's going to blow your mind. Because when the springtime comes and the temperature has to be below a certain point for a length of time for those buds to mature in the winter time, do you realize that your maturity is in your barren state? Your maturity is in your wilderness. Your maturity is in that season where you seem desolate. But it's in that season that all of a sudden, once the temperatures have been below 40 degrees Fahrenheit for a certain length of time, then all of a sudden, it's long enough. The time is up. Hallelujah. And when the temperatures start to rise and the dew starts to thaw out, all of a sudden, that bud says, I'm coming out. Woo! Hallelujah. The bud determines that it's coming out. Do you understand this? We think that we're waiting on God when instead God is waiting on us. Amen. And so as that bud comes out, it sends, it sends chemical signals down to the roots. Now remember, the vascular system is shut down. There's no water being supplied to it yet. But because of the new growth, because of it coming out, it sends a message to the roots and it says, hey, I need some water. Woo! Hallelujah. Do you understand this? That your barren season shows you your desperate need for water. It shows you the need for God's word. Amen. So Renan means to rejoice. It means to cry out. And it's composed of the Hebrew letters Resh, Noon, and Noon. Resh is the angel of a man's face. And it means head highest in person. Noon is a fish swimming through water. It means life and activity. So it's Resh, Noon, Noon. So the word picture for sing is the head having the activity of life. Woo! The head, the mind, woo! Having the activity of life. Is this not what happens in the springtime? The bud is on the tree and it says, I've got life in me and no devil can hold it back. No winter season because winter is over. I've been tight, tight. I've been pressed down and I'm not staying in that pressed down place. I'm coming out, hallelujah, because I have a song, because I'm going to rejoice woo, in Jesus' name. Now here we see that God sings over his barren woman. And then in verse 2, he says, enlarge the place of your tent. 
Oh my goodness, you're gonna love this. You're gonna be so glad you came on just to hear this. The word tent in Hebrew is oh hell, oh hell, woo! Did you hear that, Satan? Oh hell, he better be shaken because I'm not only coming out, God's spreading me out. He's spreading the tent out and tent is oh hell. It sounds just like you're saying oh hell. And why? Because all of hell is intimidated that the tent of God is being made known. This word tent, oh hell, means a tent covering. It means conspicuous from a distance. Woo! Hallelujah! Do you understand that, saints of God? The enemy can see you from a distance and all of hell is trembling because, hallelujah, the tent of God is coming out. It means conspicuous. It means dwelling. It means cover. It means tabernacle. It means tent and it means home. The Hebrew letters that form this word tent, oh hell, are actually Aleph, Hay, and Lamed. But this is what's interesting because this comes from the root word ahal. And ahal means to be clear and to shine. Woo! Hallelujah. Do you understand this, saints of God? When you have Holy Spirit, it takes your barren season for the brightness of the power of the light within you, hallelujah, to shine forth, to cause you to be a tent. So when we see this tent, hallelujah, it is the power of the anointing, the grace of Holy Spirit rising up in you. And that anointing is spreading out. And as with a grapevine, once the bud tells the roots, I'll need some water. What happens? The xylem system, the vascular system of the plant, connects the bud to the roots. And the roots know the need for the bud's water. And it brings the water up from the roots. Ephesians 3, 17 and 18 being rooted in the love of Christ. And it gives it to a bud that's closed up and waiting to spring out. It's out of the nub. It's pushed through. And actually what they call that, are you ready? They call it breakthrough. Bud breakthrough. Woo! I'm going to turn around on that one. Hallelujah. Woo! I'll tell you what, buds, buddies, you're going to break through. They call it bud breakthrough. So the bud breaks through the nub on the branch. And once it breaks through, hallelujah, the signal is sent to the roots. And the roots bring the water. And all of a sudden, the bud starts spreading out. It starts stretching out. And a leaf pops up here and pops out here and pops out here. And then a long stem of small tender grapes pop out all over. Do you understand that God is enlarging you? Why? Because He's given you Holy Spirit. He's given you woo, the new anointing woo, for your call in Jesus' name. So this word tent in Hebrew, Aleph, Hay, and Lamed compose the letters. Aleph is the ancient symbol of an ox. It means strength beginning in first. Lamed is the ancient symbol of the tongue. It means tongue control and uh, cattle goad. And it means tongue control and authority. And hey is the ancient symbol of a stick man holding his arms up, worshiping. And it means to reveal. So the word picture here that you have as it relates to this tent is the strength from the beginning that is revealed through the authority of the tongue. Woo! Hallelujah. The strength of God from the beginning, from eternity. Hallelujah. Where you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. That strength, hallelujah, is coming to you and is revealed to you, hallelujah, in your winter season where you now have received the authority of God. Don't despise your winter seasons. Why? Because that's where you're growing. Now we see here also the tent, that it is enlarging. And as we look at this tent, it also represents the mind, the mind of Christ. How much of your soul, your heart, and your mind are given to the Word of God where the spirit of understanding has revealed the truth of His Word by His knowledge and His wisdom, by His counsels and by His might. 
by the Spirit of the Lord and the fear of the Lord, hallelujah, bringing you into a new season. When we look at this tent, Scripture says, and let the curtains, not only is the tent enlarging, listen to this, saints of God, let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out, spared not, lengthen your cords, and strengthen your stakes. Hallelujah. Do you understand? This is God who has brought the new anointing, and He is bringing a greater grace for you to walk in the authority of the call that God has given you. Amen. So let's look at these cords, where not only are the curtains stretched out, but also the cords are lengthened. Hallelujah. In fact, let's look at the lengthening of those cords. I've got a lot of notes. Let me make sure I'm in the right place. Amen. So here, when we look at the lengthening, that those cords are being lengthened. Amen. In fact, let me look inside of this book. I'm just going to cheat and look inside this book because my handwriting is not that great today. And again, I'm looking, I'm doing pages 123 from page to page 136. Also, here's the representation of that tent. You see that tent? That tent, hallelujah, is the bridal tent. It is the intimacy of you with Jesus, the Word. Woo! Hallelujah. And as you know the Word of God, you see the power of Holy Spirit stretch you out into a new season. So now let's look at God lengthening those cords. Amen. We're going to look at the cords. This, this word for cords is the Hebrew word methar. Methar, and it actually means a tent or a string, a bow, a cord. And it comes from the Hebrew word yathor, which means to excel. It means to exceed. It means to uh, be a remnant. And it means to make plenteous. And it also means to preserve. So when we're looking at cords, it's actually more than we can think or imagine. Because as we look at cords, we're reminded about what cords signify in Scripture. Cords signify power. And we see this actually in Scripture in Psalm 2, verses 2 through 4. The kings of the earth take their places. The rulers take counsel against the Lord and His anointed one, the Messiah. And they say, let us break their bands of restraint asunder and cast their cords of control over us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord has them in derision and in supreme contempt He mocks them. What do cords represent? Cords represent power and control. Scripture says a threefold cord is not easily broken. It can be broken, but it's not easily broken. So when we look at the attack of the enemy, it is also seen in Scripture through the Psalms as cords. And as the enemy has cords, we too, hallelujah, by the power of God's Word, have those cords. And what are those cords? It is the keys of the kingdom, Matthew 16, where God has given us authority to bind what is already bound in heaven and to loose what is already loosed in heaven. That is the example of cords. So let's look at this Hebrew word, mathar, mathar, and let's look at the Hebrew letters that compose it. It is mem, yud, tov, and resh. Mem, yud, tov, and resh. And I'm just going to tell you the word picture for time's sake. It means the massive works are of covenant being wrought in your mind. The massive works of covenant being wrought in your mind. So when we see the tent and when we see the barren woman that is, has the singing coming over her person, it is all about the transformation of the mind. Now let's go further. As scripture says, to the barren woman about lengthening her cords, the cords to her tent. That word lengthening is the Hebrew word arak, and it means to make long, it means to draw out, and it means to lengthen. It's composed of the three Hebrew letters, alif, resh, and kof, and I'll go over these briefly. Alif is the ancient symbol of an ox, it means strength beginning in first. Resh is the ancient symbol of a man's face. It means head highest in person. And cough is the ancient symbol of a palm of a hand. And it means to cover, to open, and to allow. So the word picture for lengthening the cords, are you ready? 
is the strength of the mind, the head, that is a result of the covering, that helmet of salvation, the mind of Christ, that allows that strength to come forth. Now listen to this, saints of God. The strength of the mind. What mind are we talking about? Our mind in what? That we are covered with a helmet of salvation, which is the very mind of Christ Jesus. And as we have that strength, hallelujah, of the mind of Christ that knows the very thoughts and intentions of the Father's heart, that know His hope, that know His future, that know His plans for us, amen, we have that strength revealed, saints of God. Now let's go further. Not only are we looking at the cords being lengthened, we're also looking at the stakes, the stakes, the strengthening of the stakes. I'm trying to keep ahead. I'm trying to stay on point. The strengthening of the stakes. This word strengthen in Isaiah 54 2 is actually the Hebrew word hazak, hazak. And it means to fasten upon, to seize, to be strong, strengthen, be of good courage, hold fast, lean, maintain, prevail, become mighty. Did you hear that Hebrew word? It had the meaning also to seize. So when we're talking about strengthening the stakes, this is, this is likened unto Matthew eleven twelve. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent one sees it by force. So as you are transformed into that mind of Christ, as you've gone through the winter season, and you have that new growth, hallelujah, and you know your anointing, you know what God's called you to do, you have that strength supplied to you from above as you see the kingdom of heaven and you seize it by force. Woo! Hallelujah. Do you understand that the kingdom of God is in our hearts and the kingdom of heaven is up where the Father is, where we are blessed with every spiritual blessing, where we are joint heirs with Christ Jesus. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ. Amen. In that place, hallelujah, is all power is all authority of the age to come. God, let it be in earth as it already is in heaven, in Jesus' name. Let's go further as we look at this particular word picture for strengthen. This word picture for strengthen that we're looking at, Chazak, is composed of Chet, Zayin, and Kuf. Now listen to these Hebrew letters. Chet, which is pronounced Chet, is actually the ancient symbol of a fence in an inner chamber. It means secret place, and it means to separate. Zayin, Z-A-Y-I-N. is the ancient symbol of a weapon. It means to cut and to cut off. And then Kuf, K-O-P-H, is the back of a head. And a sun on the horizon. It means last, follow behind, and rising. So are you ready for the word picture for strengthen? The word picture is being separated to follow Christ. As you are cut in the secret place. Woo! Hallelujah. Now I put in parentheses so you can see it. I know it's backwards. But I put Christ in the parentheses because that is my emphasis. So the word picture is being separated to follow as you are cut in the secret place. Well, who are we going to follow? Christ. Amen. We are strengthening the stakes. God is strengthening the stakes for the barren woman. Stakes is yothed. And it means to pin. It means to fast. It means peg, nail, paddle, stake. And so when we look at this word, yothed, it is composed of three Hebrew letters. Are you ready? Yud, Tov, and Delet. Yud, Y-O-O-D. This is an ancient symbol of an arm at work. And it means works make deed. Tov, T-A-V. is an ancient symbol of a cross. Sign, seal, mark, covenant, and delet, D-A-L-E-T, is the ancient symbol of a door. It means to enter, and it means pathway. So the word picture for stakes is the works of covenant that you have entered. Woo! Do you hear this, saints of God? The anointing comes, and it spreads out as the power of the grace that is supplied to you causes you to enter the new season. To enter the door. Woo! Hallelujah. And as we end here, we're going to end. Man, I'm super fast. Thank you, Jesus, because I'm still trying to beat this battery light. So here we're going to end that God, when you are spread abroad, when the anointing comes upon you in the new season, hallelujah, 
to cause you to break through that you shall not be ashamed and no longer shall you remember the approach of your widowhood. In fact, you shall forget shame. Now, this is one of my favorite verses. I have a lot of favorite verses in scripture. This is one of my favorite verses because I know the power of Holy Spirit to remove the locust, to remove what the canker worm has done, to bring in a strong west wind and remove the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. I pray that prayer along with Isaiah 54. I pray over people's souls. God, bring in your strong west wind. Hallelujah. And cast out all of the locusts and take them into the Red Sea. That is what scripture says. And I pray with it this verse of Isaiah 54. I say, God, no longer shall they remember shame. No longer shall they remember that barren season. Hallelujah. But God, you will bring a grace. You will bring an anointing to remove the reproach off of them. Remember when we did Gilgal last week? Gilgal actually means to remove away the reproach. So when we're looking at the barren woman, it is another season of Gilgal that you are coming out of. And this word for reproach, are you ready? This word for reproach, I love this, is the Hebrew word chapal. It's got that chet, resh, pay, pay, and hey. Chet, resh, pay, hey. So let's look at this Hebrew word chapal. Now remember that chet is actually pronounced chet. That's where you do that ch sound up here. Chet. So when you look at that Hebrew word, her paw, let me show you that. It's backwards. Her paw is actually pronounced chapal. And it means to be disgraced. It means to have a reproach. It means to have shame. This comes from the Hebrew word karof. And it means to betroth as if to surrender. It means to defame. It means to strip. And exposed by stripping, Andre. I don't know if you're watching because that's your dream. Blaspheme, rail, reproach, and up upbraid. In other words, the devil is making you think that you're married to the lie. And he is stripping you and defaming you and trying to bring shame. You have to recognize this, saints of God. And you shame the devil and you speak the word in your wilderness. Let me tell you what. The enemy will always try to bring shame. But you have to press into God and you have to refuse to buy his bads, not goods, but his bads. You have to refuse his bads and say, not only no thank you, but I am a tent. I am, oh hell, woo, hallelujah, going to terrorize you in the name of Jesus. You have to get violent and you have to seize the kingdom of heaven by force. It's not going to be given to you. God has you watching this Facebook Live. So you will get started up with holy emotions and most holy thoughts and with hope and with life. And you will know that greater is Jesus Christ in you than he that is in this earth. Now, as we get ready for me to close out with this last story, I want to just premise this, all of this. I've done it really, really fast. And again, get the book because I'm trying, get this book because I'm trying to summarize a few things out of this book that actually happened right before we get to the barren woman to give you a better understanding. So before the barren woman, God has me teach in chapter 2 about the parabola. And parabola in Greek actually means parable. Parable. So parabolas actually mean parables. Parabolas are what those satellite disks are. Parabolas are that shape that catch radio waves, that catch images from the heavens. And it takes all this data and it gets the clearest sound, it gets the clearest picture, and it translates it as close as possible in order to give that information out. So God had me teach on algebra, and algebra comes from the Arabic word jaber, and it means to restore what is missing and to equate likeness with like. So in that parabola theory that God gave me with the word, he showed me about the parables of Jesus. And what was interesting is while I was teaching and writing on this in the book, I walk down the street and there is a homeless guy. He's carrying his sleeping bag and his suitcase. And on his shirt is a lime green shirt. And it says parabola. And I went, oh my goodness, this is crazy. 
God always confirms His word because do you understand this? Algebra, algebra means to restore what is missing. Do you understand this? Your winter season is to know what is missing. What are you missing? The power of the word. The need for healing. The need for freedom. The need for deliverance. The need for more faith. If you need more faith, you need healing. You need freedom. Amen. And that is what God is teaching us in this hour. As he says, be anxious for nothing, but make your request, your supplications known to him. The flowers are not stressed out. The birds are not stressed out. Saints of God, do not be stressed out. I've been saying for the last several weeks, the devil is starting all these fires through all these demonic attacks, and you have to be able to discern it, and you have to be able to just say, Oh no! Oh hell! I'm a tent! I'm a tent! I refuse to play your game, Satan! I'm a tent! And the anointing is spreading out. So let me tell you this. As we get to the emphasis about this tent and about Isaiah 54, for, about Isaiah 54, in that parabola, the means by which you get the algebraic lineage, the equation for a parabola, is you have an axis of symmetry, an axis, a line that goes straight down and goes into the middle of the parabola, and it has what's called mirrored symmetry, where how it looks on this side of the parabola is exactly how it looks on this side of the parabola. In the parables that Jesus taught, God showed me that they were like the parabolas of His Word, taking what is in heaven and bringing that information of the power of the age to come into this earth. And when we were able to comprehend the, these parables of Christ, we would have a clearer image of the kingdom of heaven. Woo! Hallelujah. And in finding that parabola, you have to have a line right down the middle. And that's called an axis of symmetry. Now remember that because also I'm going to briefly talk about the brain because this is also on the anatomy of the brain. So there's an axis of symmetry in that parabola and it has the exact image on both sides. And we, as we look and behold the glory of God, and with an unveiled face in a mirror, we are being transformed into that likeness. As we stand in what God has called us, we no longer have it missing. God restores what is missing and he equates like with like. He says you're not a failure. You're not downcast. You're like Christ. I've made you in the image of the glory of Christ, I have given you all power and authority. So our mind has to be renewed, amen. So God had me go further in the brain and talk about neurons where there's a cell body, there's dendrites that look like trees, but there's also an axon terminal that has little branches that come out of that and that has synapses and that axon terminal has an electric, electric, communication to the other neurons. So your brain is literally firing up and lighting up as you're listening to this message. You probably have neurons going overload saying, oh my goodness, Robin Kirby God is teaching too much. Help me, Jesus. That's all right. Your brain is listening and your, neur your neurons are getting it even if you don't. And your neurons have to, by the power of Holy Spirit and your spirit man, bring you understanding because it is spiritually discerned. And so God showed me that axon, and he said, Robin, that axon in the neuron in your brain is the axis, and it represents being strengthened in the Word of God, being established in the Word of God, so that you know your likeness, so that you have the right mirror. And this is when God brought in Isaiah 54, and he said, Robin, I've got to strengthen the axis of my people. Now remember, axis is actually a pivoting point. It's what you pivot around. And God showed me a bride and the bridegroom. And we are with the word and the word is the bridegroom. And as they dance, the bride, hallelujah, just pivots around the bridegroom. She is in that place and that axis she is planted and her mind is firmly on her bridegroom. And she knows that she is the bride. 
God showed me that the saints were like coming away from understanding the dynamic of who they are called to be. And because of that, there was hindrances in walking into their destiny. But now listen to this, because this is what brings greater understanding. God is allowing your barren state because it's in your barren state that the anointing comes. It's not in your time of plenty. And look, many people might look really blessed, but just because it looks like that they have more than you and they're not going through as much as you are does not mean they're anointed. How are you going to move forward if you're not, Luke 14, 28, willing to count the cost? It will cost you everything. It will cost you everything. And saints of God, it brings you into a barren state. In order that you know the lies, the reproaches of the enemy on your soul, so that the anointing, the power of Holy Spirit, woo, hallelujah, removes that reproach, and no longer do you remember one memory. Listen to me. If you have unforgiveness, if you have pain, you pray Isaiah 54. For, and you pray for God to remove the memory. You pray to remove the shame. You pray for Him to re remove the reproach. He will remove every one. So this is where we get to end today. Y'all are going to be so delighted because I have a story to read to you. And you're going to love this. It is almost like a little kid story. But when I saw reproach, that the Hebrew word reproach was her Paul, I heard her Paul, H-E-R-P-A-W, her, Paul. And immediately I thought of the lion that had a thorn in its paw. And then I discovered this story. And I'm going to read you this story. It's on page 138. There's the lion. On 138 in this book. And it says, Many of us are pretty familiar with the story of the lion that had a thorn pulled out of its paw by a mouse. But are you familiar with the story from which it came? It came from an ancient folklore known as the shepherd and the lion. This story came from Androclus and the lion. Androclus was a slave who escaped severe treatment from Rome. After his escape, he found a cave where he would sleep. In the cave, there was a wounded lion that had a thorn in his paw. He assists the lion by pulling the thorn out of his paw. As a result, the lion is so grateful that he cares for Androclus, giving him portions of meat. Later, Androclus desires to return to civilization, so he leaves the lion. Androclus is later imprisoned when he is found out, being sent to Rome for judgment. In Rome, he is to be devoured by wild animals in what is known the Circus Maximus. In the presence of the emperor who is named Gaius Caesar, presumed to be Caligula, when he enters the arena, the lion shows affection towards him, which then earns Androclus his freedom. The emperor gives the lion as possession over to Androclus. Folklore states, Androclus would walk through town with a leash around the lion, shepherding and caring for the creature. This tale ends with a man named Appion, who claims to have witnessed this, saying, This is the lion, a man's friend. This is the man, a man, the lion's doctor. Just wow. When I saw the word reproach, I simply heard her paw and saw the lion limping with a thorn, unable to walk. Moreover, the lion needed help in getting the thorn out. The thorn represents the messages of Satan sent to buffet our carnal nature, which is the beast nature within us. When we have a message of Satan in our mind, it is a thorn pricking the carnal nature, which is the beast-like, and we do not mirror God's love. Thus, it takes the great physician's care in removing our thorn, the reproach, so that we receive love and then reflect it. Once the wild beast, the lion in the story, was relieved of the thorn, he was changed. The help and care given to the creature by Androclus 
was then mirrored in the way in which the lion cared for Androclus. Do you see this? The man was the lion's doctor, and as a result, the wild beast became the man's friend. He was tamed by love. Likewise, there is a wild nature revealed in our tongue that has to be tamed. And when it is tamed, we flow in the knowledge of God's glory. He removes the thorn and He heals us. So many people speak out of the wounds in their soul, which are the dendrites of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not realizing that they are speaking out of the thorn of the enemy in their flesh. They have learned behaviors because of past experiences that are continually happening in their present. They have not let God heal them by removing their thorn. The thorn is the reproach in our mind that has to be removed. And Androclus removed the thorn from the lion's paw. Because of the lion being healed, they became dear friends. Who would ever think a wild beast could be tamed only by the power of love that brings healing ointment can we walk in the benefit of God's blessings, seeing His gift of grace enlarge in us. Woo! Hallelujah! What is interesting is that Androculus, are you ready for what the name means? It means the glory of man. Woo! Hallelujah! When we receive healing that the Word of God brings, then it brings forth the knowledge of His glory. Woo! Hallelujah. Do you hear this, saints of God? God is bringing a greater grace. He's bringing a greater anointing. And when I heard Androculus and how he had judgment at Rome, it made me think of Jesus and how Jesus was nailed to the cross even though the Pharisees instigated it, how Jesus was nailed at the cross and Rome was behind it as well. And when I think of this man, Jesus Christ, as we come to Passover next week, hallelujah, he went to the cross and he nailed our sins to the cross. He took every reproach, woo, hallelujah, and glory to God, by His crucifixion and His resurrection, He has removed the thorn in Jesus' name. So I pray God's grace be upon you. I pray the power of Holy Spirit come in and upon you as you are in that compressed place that looks desolate, that looks barren, and that the anointing, woo, hallelujah, will fall upon you by Holy Spirit from the Father above, and as Holy Spirit comes upon you, that glory to God, your tent shall be enlarged, your cords shall be lengthened as you speak, and the authority and the tongue of God Almighty, woo, hallelujah, causing hell to tremble in Jesus' name. And as you speak that truth, seeing that your stakes have been strengthened and you are firmly planted to know the very mind of Christ Jesus and that all the reproach of your old season, of that widowhood, of that shame, that it shall be utterly cast off of you in Jesus' name. And I call in Isaiah 61, 7, that you will have a double portion of honor for that time of shame, as God does the miraculous in Jesus' name. God is telling me, Crystal, He's going to do the miraculous for you, sister. He's telling me, those who are watching on here, to be encouraged. Be not weary in well-doing, but know that the Father hears you, He is answering you, and He is bringing your breakthrough in Jesus' name. God bless you. I love you. See you next week in Jesus' name.